Potter files, we have reached that moment we have all dreaded since the last book came out. The beginning of the end of having a new book or film perpetually looming on the horizon to satisfy our fix. With the release last week of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1, that means we only have one more film to look forward to. Most of us have literally grown up with Harry, so the producers decided to split the final book into two movies. Deathly Hallows Part 1 actually covers two-thirds of the story and follows the exploits of Harry, Ron, and Hermione as they try to complete Dumbledore's mission of finding and destroying the Horcruxes, those magical objects in which Voldemort has placed pieces of his soul. In addition, Voldemort is in search of the Deathly Hallows for himself because this trio of magical objects together make their owner master of death, thus securing eternal life and victory over Harry. Will Harry find the Horcruxes and stop Voldemort from acquiring the Hallows before it is too late? If you read the book, you already know that answer, but the genius of Rowling's books is in how we get there. The decision to break the last book into two films so as not to be forced to cut out vital elements of the plot met with enthusiasm and scorn. I hate to be Debbie Downer, but having now seen former TV director David Yates' third outing in the Harry Potter film franchise with Deathly Hallows Part 1, I think it could and should have been made in one film. I say this because the desire to avoid the difficulties of good adaptation inherent in breaking it into two movies has only encouraged Yates' worst tendencies as a filmmaker. The script would have benefited from more rigorous editing, since keeping so many of the book's events meant cutting the motivation and character detail that leads up to these moments. This approach causes the pacing of the film to be very choppy as well as the plot. We can practically feel the director over our shoulder ticking off the required scenes to appease the audience. But without the storytelling expanse of the novel to fully depict how these events come to pass, the film registers as all climax and no crescendo, so nothing stands out or truly connects. That is not to say that there aren't some positive things to say about the movie. Some of Yeats's changes actually work. Hermione tearfully uttering the spell that erases her parents' memories of her to protect them from Voldemort is part of a very strong opening which shows each of our three heroes contemplatively perusing their homes as if going off to war, knowing that they may never return. Yates is at his best when depicting evil or darkness. He registers the horror of Voldemort's monstrous nature in the cruel and senseless murder that opens the film and the scene where Voldemort's soul emerges from the locket and taunts Ron with his worst thoughts and fears also effectively communicates the purging of Ron's personal demons and his destruction of them in destroying the Horcrux in that moment. All scenes with Bellatrix Lestrange, played with twisted relish by Helena Bonham Carter, are a knockout, especially the disturbing scene in Malfoy Manor where she tortures Hermione for information and her own pleasure. Best scene, ironically, was not created by Yeats. In the film, Hermione recites the tale of the three brothers, a fairy tale that is crucial to the plot, as it is visualized in a black and sepia-toned animation sequence by Ben Hibben. The look of this scene is equal parts Edward Gorey, Tim Burton, and the brothers Quay, and really brings to life the darkness of the story and the importance of this knowledge to the characters' similar quest. Fans and casual viewers alike will enjoy the seven Potter scene at the top of the film, and the seamless effects that show each of the characters slowly transforming into Dan Radcliffe. Emma Watson is clearly the best actor of the three kids, and her performance successfully transcends the script's lack of motivation. She is consistently believable, which is more than can be said of Daniel Radcliffe. You would think after playing the same character for six films that an actor would have developed a sixth sense for it. Daniel Radcliffe looks only to have developed chest hair and a five o'clock shadow. All in all, I would say the film is somewhat of a disappointment in many ways and excellent in others. But it ultimately fails to translate to the screen the emotional and intellectual scope of Rowling's modern fairy tale. But have no fear, all the action has been saved for the next film, which comes out in summer 2011, and which I will still be waiting to see at the stroke of midnight, regardless of my misgivings. I'm Samir Roy, and this has been another edition of CalTV Movie Review. Thanks for watching.